Seattle, but I love New York. Um, okay, Chris, thank you so much for being here. Um, I appreciate you taking your time out. I know you're a busy dude. Um, and so I really, I really appreciate your time. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for uh, having me on. Yeah. Um, so I first heard you talk at the American College of Nutrition Conference last year. You came to Seattle. Have you been to Seattle outside of that? I've been there before to, for the Allen Institute and to give some talks at University of Washington, UW, as they call it there. Uh, yeah. So I enjoyed the campus and a lot of researchers there, geneticists, genomics people. So I love the city. It's a great place. Yeah, well, it's 78 degrees now. It's beautiful, sunny outside. <laughs> These are our two months of summer here. <laughs> you get. We pay the rest of the year for, so <laughs> it's nice here. How is it in New York? Uh, it's good. It's good. It's actually nice. It's warm here. And, you know, the subways have that summer subway smell where they begin to smell like strange creatures are, are growing, you know, growing and brewing and, and growing in there. I just made a new word. Yeah, there are uh, <laughs> strange things happening in the subways in the summertime. But um, Well, I'm, I'm going to have you talk about that study here on this podcast. It's yes, yes. just fascinating. Okay. Um, okay, so I'm a big story person. I think that information is um, you know, best received through a story. So I would love to hear your story and I want to go like all the way back. So if you can think back to like when you were a kid and stuff, like I want to hear, how did you get involved even in science in general? Like what were you into as a kid? And then mm -hmm. in your later life, how did you get into this like new field of functional genomics? And I'll have you explain kind of what that is to people too. So take us back. Great, great. Yeah, I started as one cell, as we all do, as an embryo, and then I started dividing, and I got more curious as time went on. I actually, that was what really the genesis of me wanting to become a geneticist was learning a, the fact that when we have uh, the first cell, it has all the instructions for the synthesis of all the cells in our body, and I was and still am endlessly fascinated by that sort of regulatory landscape that facilitates all the differentiation of all the cells in our body. So. Uh, and it's all there. Like, it really, it's extraordinary that the book of life, we didn't even have the book of life when I was a kid. We didn't know what all the letters of the genetic code were that you could read in a book. But in 2001 and 2003, the first human genome sequences were completed and updated. And now then we could read the book of life. We could at least see the letters, but we still didn't really understand the code. Uh, and that process is the ongoing work of genetics in, in my laboratory and also at Longevity is to think about how can we better understand the changes of the genetic code, uh, not only the human genetic code, but also the microbial code, which comes with us and on us and all around us. So I really, uh, I think it's just this extraordinarily beautiful aspect of biology that from one cell you can create every other cell and that you have this continual interplay of human cells and microbial cells and what happens when you walk down the street, when you ride the subway, when you go to space. Uh, all these things that we've studied that we know affect your biology, but um, we can now actually see them really for the first time. And so um, that was my, when I was a kid, what got me curious. And also uh, when I got older, just the fact that we can, we can now sequence DNA much cheaper than we ever could before. So we can now actually read the book of life in many cells very quickly. So it lets us ask all kinds of new questions and find new biology. That's so awesome. And in, in undergrad, did, did you go to undergrad with a major in mind? Uh, yes, so, so actually, I mean, my you know genesis moment uh, about genesis of cells, I guess, came in like eighth grade, ninth grade, learning about genetics and embryology, and I knew then that I, I just thought it thought, and then still think that's the coolest thing is that, that the genetic code uh, has it built into it this uh, sort of view of the future of what all the cells can be, and I wanted to study genetics, so I did my undergrad in Madison, Wisconsin. So I love cheese and bratwurst and beer and uh, staying out late at night in Madison. So I did at UW Madison. My undergrad degree was in genetics. My PhD was in genetics. My postdoctoral clinical work was in genetics. So I did, that's all genetics all the time. And uh, so okay. I moved from Madison and then did my PhD at Yale uh, in New Haven and focused there on Drosophila genetics and developmental genetics and also computational genetics. So I learned early on that one of the powerful aspects of modern genetics and biology is you can make billions or trillions of data points, but then you require computational methods and algorithms to be able to understand that data. So I focused a lot then on coding and algorithm development uh, for my PhD, and then also especially in my postdoc, looking at clinical genetics and uh, what happens when you have severe inherited disease or disease that arises uh, in, in large families. So I finished there and then also did a fellowship at Yale Law School on gene patents and intellectual property cool. uh, and understanding how patents work. 
and also I was a pro bono witness for the AMP versus Myriad case, which which challenged the gene patents. Like for example, the BRCA1 gene used to be patented by Myriad Genetics, but we thought that was crazy because you, how do you patent gene that exists in nature that seemed kind of weird? It turns out you're not supposed to be able to according to the Supreme Court. So eventually we did win that case, which was great. Amazing. Uh, and That's I started great. My, uh, so that was my postdoctoral work and PhD and then uh, started my lab in New York City at Cornell at the medical school in 2009. Awesome. Okay, so you've really attacked genetics from like all these different points of view. It's the bio, the biotech, law, like yeah, yeah. it is all genetics all the time for you. Yeah, 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 it is. Well, genetics is the best. There's no no contest. Yeah. I love it. Um, okay, so you mentioned beer and brats and cheese. So since I <laughs> focus on nutrition, I want to hear about like your nutritional world. So you have, so, you know, us, we know so much about science and nutrition and like our bodies and stuff like that. So Sometimes it's interesting to see how we either turn that information on for ourselves or like me, the ability to like turn off that information <laughs> um, at certain times. Like I don't really want to know the whole calories in my meal right now so I can <laughs> turn that off. Um, so growing up, what was your kind of like food culture in your house growing up? Were you in the clean plate club? Did you have a ton of veggies on your plate? Was it like boxed meals? Like what, what was your food culture? Oh, great question. So I actually, you know, growing up my, you know, even though this was in the 70s and 80s, then usually uh, women and usually mothers cook, but my mom was always uh, working. She was a, a professor at uh, Parkside. And but my dad was working too, but he just always would get home first and he cooked basically. So was, my dad was cooking usually Italian meals. Uh, so lots of overeating, I'd say lots of pasta, lots of carbs. Uh, but then also, we well, I was a swimmer as well, so we were always on the road going to swim meets, and so a lot of like random McDonald's meals or things you get on a drive-through. Yep. Uh, you know, probably the worst of possible meals growing up, in the sense that when we're on the road, you would just grab whatever you could uh, yeah. between swim meets. So it was not the, but I did like vegetables. I had this fantasy of owning my own salad restaurant chain when I was like nine years old. That, you did? I did. I love salad. I still love salad. It's great. And so I would go to the salad bar at like the uh, pizza shop and eat all the salad. So I, you know, I, I, because uh, I, I was the youngest of three, so I would make these little salads and then bring them to my uh, older brother and older sister and, and say, I made you salad for my restaurant. And then uh, my, my brother learned this trick that he would say that I made the best toast. He said, you know, Chris, you make the best toast. Can you go make me more toast? He's just laying on the couch. And really it's just toast. I just put it in and then put butter on it. But he got me convinced that I made the best toast uh, just so he didn't have to get off the couch. And so I learned what is the, um, you know, the, the toils of being the younger brother is that you will get taken advantage of, even for toast. But uh, oh my like, god, I love it. <laughs> That's smart. What does your brother do now? Is he in well, some sort of like good <laughs> career where he can use that to his to his advantage? You know, that's a great. In fact, he is. He's the mayor of a city right now, so he's a politician. Yes. Yeah, so. oh, that's amazing. <laughs> so it's actually a perfect, uh, you know, preamble to what he became later in life as uh, navigating the uh, vagaries of human interaction. So yes, he's totally. the mayor of Wisconsin. Yeah. <laughs> and then so your dad cooked do you cook or did you learn to cook from a young age yeah I learned to cook with my dad and, and my mom also cooked a bit too but she liked baking as well but mostly mostly cook with my dad and we still cook together sometimes or grill together uh when I'm back home sometimes so uh yeah but very much uh love uh, you know learning to cook with him and I've since watched a lot of cooking shows uh, my wife loves cooking shows so it's kind of like the default uh you know show that's on will be some cooking show on the cooking Network channel yep uh, yeah, uh, and I loved uh, Alton Brown, who did a lot of uh, the science behind cooking. I so love Alton Brown too. He's phen phenomenal. So I bought his whole DVD set when it came out when I was in grad school. I was probably the only genetics grad student at Yale, look, watching all of Alton Brown's show. But he, he really brought the science to the cooking, which I think is one of the, the coolest parts of thinking about what happens to the molecules, how they get transformed, uh, just like kind of what happens to cells. In, in this case, it's just plant cells or other cells. Yeah. Oh, good. I'm so glad there's another like geek out cooking person. Out there. <laughs> yes. I love it too. People are like, oh, I don't want to know that much about my food. <laughs> uh, um, okay, cool. So I want to get into a little bit of your research and um, yeah. the kind of two studies that I, well, I'm sure you've been involved in so many studies and in your lab is look, working on so many things, but I think two that most people either may have heard about or um, would be interested in um, is the New York subway study, which I'll let you talk about with the microbes and how crazy that was. And then working on the NASA twin study. So tell us about um, the New York subway study first. 
Great. So uh, yeah, those are, those are probably you know, the two most well-known studies from the lab. We've published almost 200 papers by now in all sorts of aspects of genetics and epigenetics and cancer and disease, uh, you know, new mechanisms of how RNAs work inside cells. But the, the two things I get asked the most about are, okay, tell me about the subway study and what's happening in space. So <laughs> the, the subway, subway study started in actually when my daughter was about three years old. And we're riding the New York City subway and, you know, as children do, they'll play and wander around. And the, she actually was just swinging around the pole and at one point stopped and we're like, was staring at it and then just did a straight on stare down and then lick of the subway pole uh, right in front of me. And I had this moment of terror. And if, if for any of the parents out there, if you just see it happen, you know, you know, something has just transpired. There is an exchange that has occurred. There's nothing you can do about it. It's already happened. And I just became really immediately curious because, you know, this happens not just on mouths on subway poles, but hands in hands. We, type, we shake hands with people. There's a continual microbial exchange. It's always existing, but we know very little about it. So actually, right after that happened, I, you know, told her to kind of wipe her mouth and just knew there's nothing I could do. But when we got home, I got really curious. I'm a geneticist. I'm a scientist. I'll be like, well, let's see what's been published about it. Let's see, let's see what's been Google Scholar or in PubMed or in archives. And there had never been a single paper about what's on the surfaces of subways. There'd been two papers about what's in the air, uh, we're using an old, old technology called 16S. Uh, and there was you know, one paper about buses I could find, but there was nothing, uh, and that was just in one city and a few buses, but nothing about the subways. So I thought, well, that, you know, that seems strange. It's, it's written by 5.5 million people every day in New York City. I'm like, how would we not want to know what's happening when there's that many people exchanging hands and cells and microbes? So, in the summer of 2013, I had a, a bunch of undergraduates who were in lab for the summer from Cornell and from Hunter and from CUNY, and they were interested in anything in genetics. They're there for the summer, and they said, well, Dr. Mason, you know, we're here to work on whatever, but I've seen all these things in your lab website. Um, I'm, I'm here to do whatever you want, whatever is interesting for the summer. And I said, well, you know, because I was thinking about my daughter, and I looked at the map of the New York City, I thought, you know, cancer and inherited disease and epigenetics, you know, these are, these are complex mysteries. They're not going to go anywhere. Uh, we'll keep working on those. But you know, it's never been done as a genetic map of an entire metropolis. And I asked them, how do you feel about wandering around New York City subways and systematically collecting samples of all 468 subway stations in triplicate all summer long? And they said, yeah, let's, that sounds great. Let's do it. So <laughs> I had these really fantastic undergrads who just got passionate about it. We built an app for it. So as you, as you log data, it shows up on it. It gets geotagged and timestamped. We did a crowdfunding campaign to get some support for it. We, you know, set up a protocol, uh, enlisted other uh, people to help for certain days, and, and then got it done. Got 1,500 samples collected in a few months all across the city, every single station, uh, and then brought them back to the lab, extracted the DNA, sequenced it. And the really exciting thing is, after getting all that data back, we started to make these maps, basically make genetic maps across the entire city, or actually we call it the microbial map of the uh, metropolis or and then New Yorker called it the metropolome like is the idea mm -hmm. uh, so we could see different densities of different you know microbes all over the city and there's three really I think big findings about the, the study one is and still one of my favorite parts of it is we, we got billions and billions of fragments of DNA that we took off the surfaces and sequenced them so it's ACGT the genetic code took every fragment of DNA and then mapped it to every known species and about half of the DNA matched no known species. We didn't know where they came from. We'd never seen them before until that study. So it doesn't mean that the subway's full of alien DNA, uh, unless aliens are made of DNA, which is not impossible. But uh, you know, it just means that there's so much we don't yet know about the diversity of microbes uh, all around us or in us or even in the subway. So that was one exciting thing. Like on average, half the world under our fingertips is unknown. The second thing that was really exciting is that we could actually see almost like a genetic echo or molecular echo of what had happened at certain stations. So this was like one station we worked with the MTA to swab before they opened it back up to the public after it had been flooded by Hurricane Sandy. Yeah. So in this case, the subway station still looked like ocean bacteria and fish bacteria on the walls of the subway because it had been flooded by ocean water, which was very interesting to see. Uh, and the third thing I really love about the study, I mean, I like lots of things about the study, but the third thing is really interesting is uh, also, we looked at the human DNA, so look on the benches of each station and compared it to the United States Census data. So we could recapitulate, basically recreate the United States Census map based on the human DNA left behind. So it would look like it was black, white, Asian, Hispanic DNA left behind in the stations that looked a lot like the census data. So Chinatown looked a lot more like Asian DNA and Harlem looked a lot more like 
uh, black ancestry DNA. So you can actually see some of the ancestry, like African ancestry showing up in different parts of the city that you would expect. So uh, it was really these uh, kind of, you could observe what's happening in the station without even uh, having anyone there, but just by what's left behind. There's so much information. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just little cells. There's, just, there's a plethora of information and a lot of it that we don't even like, uh, like you said, we don't even like understand the information yet. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, that we've just discovered for the first time. Yeah. That's so cool. Um, and so you got a lot of publicity for that. I mean, like yeah, magazine, yeah. like so much <laughs> stuff. Yes, yeah, so it was on the cover of the Wall Street Journal. It was in New York Times. It was, uh, it was crazy. It was everywhere. It was, uh, well, it's, it's one of the things, it's, it's like it touched, I think, uh, uh, something that everyone thinks about a lot like you're on a bus you're on a subway you grab a pole and then sometimes it's still warm and you're like oh that's kind of gross you know or you have yeah. or sometimes it's like moist in a capacity that you have no information about and you're like well why is that wet you know and there's there's all these moments that are just kind of like eek moments but um but there's little information right so i think the best thing to do is to replace uh fear of something with actual data on what's there and so most of the species were um commensals just things you find on skin most of them are harmless. Anything that looked like it could be a pathogen, uh, we did follow up work and show that it's probably not pathogenic, even things that sound like Staph aureus, they think of like MRSA, mm -hmm. or you hear E. coli, for example. We found a lot of E. coli, but almost none of the strains that would be potentially uh, eh, causing you disease. So uh, it's important to distinguish between what is just a normal species that's present in and, us, and around us normally versus uh, one that can get you sick, which we found very little evidence of. Yeah, and so really it's, less of a big deal than you thought your daughter yes. licking the pole. Yes, it's not. I mean, the, the, the happy ending of it is basically, well, uh, you know, it's probably okay to, uh, you know, what happened to her, but it, it still doesn't mean, it, it depends what's there, right? The, the long yeah. answer I gave once is I said that it's, you know, it depends on who's there. If someone just sneezed and they do have a cold and then you were right there after, then that would be potentially bad. And if you have open wounds, it's not necessarily good. But writ large, given most people with a you know intact immune system and generally functional, it's probably okay uh, for the most part. But then you know there was one reporter that did say like, well, licking subway poles is probably okay. You know, says expert. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm taken out of context. <laughs> yeah, not quite <laughs> but, what I said. <laughs> but statistically, it's true. It's likely okay. Is there anyone that's tried to replicate that in different other big hub cities? Yeah, great question. So um, uh, Curtis Huttenhauer led a study that was published a year later. Uh, they did the same thing in Boston. So they had actually done uh, looking at the, the handrails and the stations, and they showed very similar results. For example, a lot of the DNA matched no known species it's like ours. The surfaces looked a lot like skin bacteria, which is exactly what you'd expect, and that's what we observed as well. Uh, and they also could see evidence of like antibiotic resistant bacteria, but we saw the same thing. So you know, again, things that sound like they're scary, but realistically, those are just bacteria trying to survive. So they're not really out to get you, they're just trying to survive and compete against each other. So Boston's replicated. We've now also expanded the study uh, with the help of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the World Fund Foundation and a grant from the NIH to now over 100 cities around the world uh, coordinating this project. So it's now become a global uh, ongoing genetic monitoring of uh, the Earth cities. And recruiting a lot of undergraduates, I'm guessing. Yes, yeah, there's actually, yeah, we just posted some of the results uh, online last week and one of their response on Twitter was, how much did this cost and how did you pay all these people? And I said, you know, a lot of them really just love the project. It's all, they just want to be cute. Yeah, it was, it was, it was great. So I think it, again, it's just this real sort of consistent thread of curiosity that anyone that lives in a city, I think has. And so people have seen to really jump up the opportunity to swab their city. And there's a lot of hungry students out there looking, looking to get involved <laughs> right. in something, learn a little well, bit. It's great. And they get, you know, they get their names on papers and they get uh, research experience, all the usual things, but, uh, but totally. fundamentally it's, it's curiosity really. That's so awesome. Um, okay, and then the other big study that, um, you know what, I found a lot of people don't even know about this study, like no, which is shocking to me. I feel like some people live under like a science rock, <laughs> you know. Um, they only watch the headlines in the media that say like coffee causes heart disease and then the next thing, <laughs> coffee saves your life. You know? <laughs> um, but this is such a fascinating thing because I think, again, like you said, the unknown it causes so much curiosity. So um, Scott and Mark Kelly, astronauts, went to space um, and you were a part of that. Was it 10 principal investigators? Yep, there are 10 lead investigators for the study. Um, so yeah, basically NASA had an opportunity where identical twins, Mark and Scott Kelly, uh, were they're, they both actually are at trained astronauts. And Scott was going up for a one year mission, the longest ever mission for NASA for one person in space. 
And during a press conference, Scott said, okay, I'm about to go for this year and we'll be planning for the mission. One of the reporters had said, well, you have, don't you have an identical twin brother? Is NASA gonna do anything with that? And then they said, well, we're not planning that, but maybe we should. So then they talked about it and Mark was technically retired. He's actually not running for the Senate in Arizona, uh, Mark Kelly. Oh, awesome. And, and he, uh, he, he kind of said, okay, I'm game. And basically would have to share, you know, give blood, sweat, tears uh, effectively to the study to donate all these samples and be coordinated uh, with the collection. And, and they said, all right, let, let's do it. So then NASA put out a request and said, okay, we'll get, they give us your best and brightest ideas and we'll select uh, 10 different teams to work together on this one integrated project. And so my lab was one of the 10 chosen teams to look a lot at, at DNA and RNA changes uh, in the twins. So cool. So what are some of the um, kind of specific things that you were looking at in your lab? Um, and were you looking at, were you assigned to one twin or are you doing both? Uh, both. So we uh, it basically it broke down kind of in the components of the cell and the body is what each of the teams were doing. So we looked at the genetics, the epigenetics. We looked at RNA, so how, how genes become activated. Some teams looked at the proteins. Some looked at uh, telomeres, like Susan Bay looked at telomeres, the little ends of your chromosomes that keep your DNA packaged. Other groups uh, looked at sort of cognition, so how fast is the reaction time after going to space. Or other things looked at, say, the vasculature, what happened to your veins and your arteries after the stress of space travel, or the eyes, which have these damaged, it's called space flight associated neuroocular syndrome, or SANS. It basically means your eyes get screwed up in a nutshell. Uh, from the pressure and also the, the, just the stress of space flight, it can create uh, basically folds in the retina that can make your vision worse when you get back. So uh, it's, one interesting side note is it seems to be less effective for female astronauts mm -hmm. for reasons that are not fully clear, but might have to do with the capacity of the female anatomy to tolerate large changes in volume uh, of, of fluids and water during pregnancy. So maybe it might have a, a bit of a better ability to tolerate that. So maybe the first mission to Mars might be more female than male. Uh, so they can see better when they get there. Yeah. Uh, and so, so we looked at all these aspects, everything from very deeply molecular to behavioral, to cognitive, to structural in, in the body, uh, 10 teams working together. And we looked a lot at DNA and RNA and also a bit of the telomere data to see what happened to the, the genome and uh, how it got activated. So what were some of the big things that you saw in the difference between the twins? Like, and um, was it progressive? So. I'm, sh I'm sure you guys did lots of de time data points, um, but did you see like an increase? And then I think I know the answer to this, but for everyone else, when he came back. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, great questions. The, we, you know, we, we looked at, I mean, we're, we're clearly limited. We can only say so much about two people, uh, one on earth and one in space, but we did to account for the limited number of subjects. We basically did a sampling about every three, four to five weeks. So we got lots and lots of data over three years and seeing how things change over time. So one of the best controls you can have, and this is true for space biology as well as for personal uh, medicine, is what do you look like over time and then when do you start to see a change? Because if you have four, five, six time points where you look normal and suddenly something changes, uh, it gives you a lot more confidence that you really were okay before and something has changed. In this case, the something was going to space. And so there we saw really, really abrupt changes. His telomeres actually got longer in space. So actually the things that normally as you, as you age, your telomeres get shorter. They shrink because you're just aging and they're, they're becoming frayed. In space, they actually got longer. So it's a strange counterintuitive fountain of youth that exists up uh, above us in space. And then when he got back to Earth, that went away very quickly, mm -hmm. uh, surprisingly. We thought it might last, but it didn't last. So the fountain of youth is in space, but you can't ever leave space, it seems, if you want to keep it to some degree. Uh, also, we saw the gene expression changes, which is when genes get activated or deactivated. We saw thousands of genes become really activated as soon as you got to space to try and adapt to space flight. And so this included genes like the genes that control how you repair your DNA, because it's getting damaged by the radiation, mm -hmm. as well as dealing with sort of stress in the body and fluid shifts. And so, so a lot of those genes become hyperactivated, plus the immune system was really on high alert. So almost every immune cell we looked at was really, really super activated and really uh, expressed at levels that we don't normally see. And so for length of time, so this was the longest that NASA had had done, um, you know, a year in space. Um, so did you find that there was kind of a point where the stressors were less or more um, so that maybe for, for new missions, you know, they could mm -hmm. say, well, up until this point, we should, you know, you should be fine or expect this at this point in space flight. Yeah, uh, actually, ironically, you'd think that after a while that the body would adapt and you get normal, but 
uh, and become more normal. But the, the gene expression changes were even more pronounced in the last six months versus the, the first six months. We saw more changes, at least in, at the genetic level of his body adapting at the gene expression level. But other things did go down, like cortisol spikes up when you get into space because your body's thinking, you know, holy crap, I'm in space. It's wrong. Uh, but then eventually it does come down. And actually Scott, to his credit, is his cortisol levels would get up when he went up there and then was very, very flat, almost at basically at terrestrial levels. So it was kind of cool as a cucumber once he got up there. But other astronaut data that I've seen, some people get to space and then cortisol spikes and it stays high because it's very stressful if it's your first time. But Scott had been up there actually three times before. So... Now, uh, four times before, so he's actually, you know, he's a bit of a veteran uh, and wasn't, uh, you know, it wasn't too hard on him at that time. So, but when he got back to Earth, this was one of the really striking parts of it is some of the markers for inflammation spiked up like 4,000 or 5,000 percent. So, jumped up to really, really high levels as his body, just as the body has to have an, uh, oh crap moment, I'm in space, it also had to, uh, oh no, I'm now, now I have to deal, use my muscles and I'm back on gravity. And you can see the stress of that on his body was extraordinarily uh, difficult. Uh, as evidenced by what he said, he said he felt like he needed to go by to the emergency room. He broke out in a rash anywhere. Like if you just sit in a chair, he'd break out in a rash on his butt cheeks because just touching anything, his, his body hadn't felt the weight of clothing in a year. So touching anything or having the weight of even just a shirt would make him break out in a rash. So it was really, uh, really difficult to return. But that went away after a few days. And so it was, it was rough at first, but it did go away. So the adaptation is miraculous. That the body yeah, that was what we, one thing we said, uh, actually, at a press conference with NASA, I was uh, summarizing the study and said, you know, it really points to the adaptability and the plasticity of the human body to really uh, deal with really different circumstances and then get back to a homeostasis. So if anything, it made me, uh, you know, even more confident in the adaptability of humans for spaceflight and even Martian missions. Uh, but some people read the study and said, oh, that sounds really awful. He said he wanted to go to the emergency room. I don't know if that sounds good, but, but it was temporary. Yeah. Well, and I think one thing that people uh, don't understand about genetics is that, um, you know, our genes don't change, but it's the expression, right? right and so this right. was one of those great yeah. examples of epigenetics where your his environment. Exactly. His, his environment's like, like attenuating and, ex and sort of controlling and increasing the expression of different genes to do that very thing, to adapt. And that's actually epigenetics is controlling when and how genes get used. And then the gene expression is that manifestation. So it really showed how the body has these extraordinary levers that it can pull and change and turn on and off genes really as needed. Um, and, you know, we, we do the same thing in our house. We don't think about it, but you walk around, you turn on one light switch and turn off another as you go into different rooms. And as you need to cook, you'll do more. As you're done for the cooking dinner, you'll turn things off. And so same thing happens in our bodies. It's just kind of, we don't even have to think about it. Yeah, it's so smart. It's just, its job is to survive. And so it's yeah, yeah, do yeah. everything it can to survive in whatever environment. Um, Absolutely. And so to clarify for people listening, so a lot of the headlines and, and kind of some of the media around this study said that his DNA changed okay. in space. So clarify that for people. Yeah, there were some, so it was actually a really funny part of the study was we were, you know, in the middle of writing up the results and we'd had a, a scientific meeting that was uh, in Houston. And, uh, you know, I was on one of the panels as well, describing what are some of the preliminary results. And so one of the ones I said as well, about 7% of his genes that had changed expression. So imagine if, it, to, to keep the numbers simple, like only 100 genes changed expression. Uh, of those that changed when he went up to space, we looked to see how many of them were still changed even six months after he's been back on Earth. Like did some of them look like the body was still kind of adapting? So we said, you know, about seven or 8% of the genes looked like they were still adapting. They still looked like he was in space basically. And so it means the body has an ongoing process. So when we said this, you know, there was a press release from NASA and it kind of sat there, but then one reporter picked it up like two months later and said, oh, wait, his, his DNA changed by 7%, even though we said his, you know, his genes changed expression, which is, you know, genes going on and genes turning off, the same genes are there, they're just being turned on and turned off. But one reporter had posted, this was in The Guardian in the UK, and said that 7% of Scott Kelly's genes uh, changed. And then uh, Scott Kelly, well, actually Mark Kelly first saw it, and then he tweeted and said, who knew of this? If my brother's DNA changed by 7%, maybe I don't have a twin brother anymore. And then Scott Kelly retweeted it and said, fine, I didn't want you as my twin anyway. You know, so they had this, like, they were just joking. Like, it was just yeah. funny. Uh, but then the media, like, all picked it up. So suddenly, uh, I, my, like, my phone in my inbox just, like, exploded one morning because everyone's saying, like, we heard he was mutated by space and that he's no longer a human. He's been mutated by 7% of his DNA. So it became a great, like for two days straight, I was just talking to reporters about like, you know, there's genetics and there's epigenetics. Like there's, yes. there's DNA that changes whether it's being activated and then the amount of DNA that's there, the 3 billion letters is still there. 
It's just whether you've turned something on or off. And I said, you know, if 7% of his DNA changed, he'd be a different species, uh, dramatically different species, you know, so uh, that didn't happen. So it was really interesting, uh, you know, misinterpretation by a lot of media outlets. Like e even the Science Daily, a big website, they had a huge headline one day, and then the next day their headline was, we were totally wrong about that space gene story. So they corrected themselves. But what they really kind of surprising was no one picked up the phone to just call. Like if you asked any geneticist, really anyone with a decent science background, they would have been like, wait, 7% of his DNA change? I think you mean his RNA? You mean gene expression, not just right. genetic content. But um, it, it, uh, it just it was spread like wildfire before we could even catch up with it. It was pretty, pretty, uh, it was funny, but also not funny, but it became more of a teachable moment than anything else. Yeah, well, I remember seeing that and I was like, whoa, 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 whoa wait a minute. <laughs> like, it, it almost made me like question my own understanding. I was like, what? Wait, am I possible? understanding this right? Because, <laughs> whoa, yeah. Um, and that headline, I saw that headline too. And, um, yes, right. but I think, I think it's really important for people to understand in the way that, and that's really what I work with, right? In mm -hmm. preventative genetics and epigenetics is, um, you know, no matter how many of those DNA tests that you take out there, because those are, widely available now, um, so many different brands, your genes stay the same, whether you took the test when you're five or 55, the genes are the same. But what, what we're trying to do is look at the epigenetics and then the genomics aspect can't, yeah. you know, you, we can't change your DNA, we can't change your genes, but can we use diet and exercise and some of these other things to change the way that your genes are expressed? Exactly. Potentially yeah. then reduce burden of disease, or disease risk or, um, you know, just enhance quality of life and things like that. So yeah. I think it's important for people to understand there's genetics, but then there's epigenetics. And the way that I kind of like to explain it to people is um, genetics are kind of like a book and all the letters in that book create, you know, a story. Mm -hmm. um, but the epigenetics is almost like the punctuation. So you can change the way that that sentence makes sense um, yeah. by adding a period or a comma or an apostrophe or whatever it is. And so that is more fluid and that's changing, whereas the, the genetics are the same. Yep. So, um, so that's awesome that you guys were looking at that kind of stuff um, yeah. on really space flight. And really to to for the exciting for the future is we're starting to look at that stuff for mars travel correct yep. yeah so the uh ongoing work we have with several projects at, uh, now, now following up is to say well that's you know it's exciting you looked at twins and one went to space but it's really only two people so i think the really exciting thing is uh working with nasa for several future missions including going back to the moon in 2024 so the goal is to get back there and have um, a permanent moon base up there as well as uh, actually what's called the gateway. So it's basically a space station around the moon uh, that's supposed to also be there by mid 2020s and using the data we've generated for the twin sort is kind of a first baseline of what we can expect and use as what are called you know, these standard measures or what is, what do we want to measure about someone to see how their body's adapting? And we have kind of laid out at least a first draft of what are all these measures, genetic, epigenetic, uh, RNA, looking at a microbiome as well, that changes, saw changes in the gut and how many bacteria are in the skin or in the gut. So looking at all these changes uh, and I'll track them for future astronauts. So the goal is that by about 2035, we're hopefully gonna have people get to Mars or maybe 2033 is what NASA is saying. Uh, SpaceX wants to get there by like the late 2020s, which is a bit ambitious, but not impossible. But in all cases, there's going to be a deep focus on, you know, precision medicine for astronauts. So how can we give them uh, the best possible care on their way there is also before they leave to look at every human cell and how it might adapt as well as each bacteria cell in, on, and then also all around the astronaut. So it's really taking all of our knowledge of personalized nutrition and genetics and medicine and putting it uh, to, you know, the best use for the astronauts and bringing it to bear for their health. Right. Because we may be able to prepare them better knowing how all these yeah. changes happen, um, which can be food, exercise, training, you know, all that stuff pre and, and during. Um, yep. so that's so Absolutely. exciting. And so, um, you know, within our grasp, I think people don't understand how close that yeah. is. Yeah, it's, it'll be, you know, for most of us, it should be in our lifetime that we'll see this happen. Uh, and it's a, re it's a renewed effort. It's a bit of a new space race between us and China and India and Russia. Uh, but also more space collaboration than, than has ever existed before. The space station has been a continuously orbiting uh, entity for uh, two decades and, and really is a, an extraordinary international effort and laboratory and kind of brings people together. So uh, it, it's both a new race to get there between commercial and government sites in different countries, uh, but as well as the most collaboration that's ever occurred for, uh, you could argue, for humanity to some degree. Yeah, it's amazing. 
Um, so looking at all these kind of epigenetic and genomic uh, markers, tell me about longevity and how this new company is looking to take some of that that you've been studying for a long time and apply it into kind of like everyday people. Yeah. So I had, I get, I got a lot of questions from people who'd say, Oh, I hear what you're doing for the Kelly twins. Can you do the same thing for me? I've had this question asked me for, for the last like six years and we, you know, to do a research protocol at, at Wild Cornell at other places, you have to, they have a long process to set up consent forms and an IRB at what's called the review board uh, to make sure that everything's done appropriately. But, you know, and there you, you can't charge people for a research study. They're supposed to just be, you know, if anything, you pay them. Mm -hmm. um, and, but there are versions of things that are, that where people can pay like 23 and me is something people know or ancestry.com. You can learn about some of your genetic features uh, and pay for that information uh, and get access to it very quickly rather than doing a long clinical trial uh, or just a study. You can just find out because you're curious. So, there, there hadn't been any company that was quite doing something even close to the twin study, uh, and we wanted to bring as much to bear from that study for anyone to give the best in class medicine and, and sort of predictive analytics as well as the biochemistry and sort of some of the biology. We wanted to bring, my, I think everyone should be able to feel like they're an astronaut, basically, or at least, <laughs> at least be studied on some of the similar levels. So I uh, met with Joel Dudley, who's a friend and co founder for the company, and Paul Jacobson. And, uh, and Paul is the CEO of Thorne, actually, which is a, basically a probiotics, prebiotics, vitamins, supplements company. And when I first met him and Joel, and he said, you know, we have these companies selling all these products. And I said, well, how do you know, you know, if these products work? And, and what's the best platform to, to figure that out? He said, well, you know, we, we know that some work because they've had physicians prescribing them for, you know, 30 years in some cases. But we don't know often exactly why or, or could it be best, you know, tuned or optimized for different patients. That's often just a clinical intuition, but you know, said we should be said, you know, we should, what if we built a company that really was an expansive, you know, basically monitoring and, you know, multi-omics platform, like look at all the layers of biology to see what's really working for people and make it so you could customize what you give them. So, and, and make it the ultimate in personalization is um, every piece of food you eat or everything you do with your body could be optimized between, between what's in you and then what's on you and then what you're putting inside yourself. So. Uh, because they they were already doing it. it was already you know three million customers at Thorn that were doing it, but no one was asking them. Well, some people were asking how does it work, but no one was measuring how well it works. So we thought, right. well, let's make a company that does that. So uh, basically, you know, made it so uh, it's the it's like the twin study uh, light version that anyone can order. And we've launched the first product, which is about gut microbiome, and uh, for particularly for people with gut dysbiosis, like IBS or IBD uh, patients or customers. And it's a mixture of basically doing direct to consumer, so anyone can order the kits online or on the app, uh, as well as some business to business collaborations, working with some pharma companies to do uh, large clinical trials. So we're taking the same technology that's monitoring patients doing clinical trials and seeing if we can uh, make changes, as well as opening up to anyone that just wants is curious for their own gut health or their own physical health. That's awesome. So if people wanted to kind of start doing this with longevity, um, you guys are live and out there now. Yep. Yep. So you can go uh, right to, you know, uh, not to, a bit of a shameless plug, but longevityhealth.com and then, or longevity.com. You can go to either one. Okay. And the idea is longevity. It's one place for sort of health, wellness, and longevity. And that you can basically, we've launched the first part focusing on the microbiome, but you can also order uh, genome sequencing as well. And then also very soon, uh, some blood work will be available to purchase through the website, which is a very small device that uh, collects blood out of your shoulder. That's very convenient. And so that's under FDA review right now. So we'll be have once that's ready uh, through the FDA, we'll have that available as well. And then the gut bio, tell me how it works. Okay, so gut bio is uh, that's the first thing that we launched. Uh, just launched this in January this year, and basically we take a collection of your stool. So yes, you do have to go into the bathroom and collect yes. a piece of your stool. It's not the most romantic uh, moment of your life, but it does inform a lot about your health and and wellness and potential for disease. So, uh, but we're working also on ways to make that collection easier. So we've uh, tried a new wipe-based method and some other methods that are just easier. Instead of having to take like a little mini spoon and scoop a little piece of your stool into a tube, you know, again, there's no dignity in that action. There's no, you know, there's, it's, there's nothing glorious about it, but it does give you lots of information. So, uh, but currently that's the method. And then you ship it off to our lab. Then about two weeks later, two to three weeks later, you'll get a report back that looks at basically we can see human DNA, plant DNA, uh, bacterial, viral, fungal. We can see all types of DNA that's in your, in your gut and see what's being processed. Do you have any evidence of inflammation, your risk for constipation, general gut health, which are based on everything that's in the published literature in terms of our knowledge of species in the gut and what they do, as well as from our own patient cohort of several thousand patients that we've, and customers that we've examined and see 
you know, when they tell us that they have constipation or diarrhea, or they come to us in some cases are very sick, we can see some of the evidence of that in their species. And so what's important to know is we don't just look at, you know, the human DNA uh, or the bacterial DNA or viral, we look at all the DNA together and it, it all tells a little bit of a different story uh, in your gut basically. And then that, so that's one point. The second more important point is we don't just tell you what's there, which is kind of like what 23andMe does. It's okay, well, here's what you've got, here's your ancestry, but you can't really do that much about it. Uh, in this case, we want to be as proactive as possible. One, when you get the test, one, that it's the most accurate up-to-date methods. And then the second is that you can actually do something about it. So if you are missing certain species that are known to create uh, B12, for example, certain microbes can make a lot of your vitamins in your body. We can recommend that you get more of them. If you're missing certain what are called keystone species, kind of like that the hold the microbiome together, we can recommend and have places that you can buy them either. Sometimes they're thorn products, but there can be other products that uh, you can buy and purchase to basically improve your, your gut dysbiosis or just in general, improve the ecosystem. It's basically like trying to re-engineer a rainforest. You wouldn't want to do just one plant at a time. You want to try, if you can, have a, a engineer the whole ecosystem all, all at once. Yeah, so that's what makes gut bio different than some of the other, because there's some other like microbiome testing companies out there. And um, so they're not looking at all of the DNA. They're either reporting on like just the bacterial species or just, and then yep. not giving you any recommendations based on it. That's right. That's right. So we can have, so we can see, you know, there's a couple of companies that have started to do something. What we would do is called metagenomics. You look at all the genomes versus an older technology is called 16S where you only look at uh, bacteria or archaea. So it's, it's just much more limited. And you also can't get down to the species or the strain, the very specific strain. Kind of like what we talked about in the beginning. Like the difference between E. coli versus an E. coli strain that might actually get you sick. You need to have the strain level resolution to inform the biology. Yeah. Um, so fascinating. And then longevity is not just going to be the microbiome. So that's another thing that makes you guys so different. You're going to turn into a one-stop shop. So there's blood work coming. Um, what else did you say? Um, uh, whole, whole genome sequencing. Uh, it's available uh, if you contact us directly now, but it'll be on the website for, uh, probably the end of this year. So you can order your whole genome sequencing. So it's not just like a microarray, like 23andMe or Ancestry, or just a, what's called exome sequencing, which is about 2% of your genome. We'll look at 100% of your human DNA for, for your risk for different diseases. Which is totally different. A lot of these yeah. companies are just doing partial, which is because it's easier, right? It's um, easier. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but the whole, I think a lot of people call the, the DNA we don't understand junk DNA, but I kind of hate that term. I think it's... Yeah. Most geneticists think it's uh, preposterous to call something junk. Uh, you just don't you know, get calling, it yet. Well, exactly. Just, you're calling something that you don't know what it is. Junk uh, is kind of like, it, it represents a, at the least a lack of imagination, but it's also just you know, inaccurate. It might be, you might not know today, but it might be perfectly functional later. And so it's, uh, right. Uh, yeah. So it, I, it, I love the fact that you guys are going to do whole genome because, you know, you'll just have it. And then when yeah. the, study come and up, the best thing is, yeah, yeah, exactly. You'll have the information. And then if a new paper comes out that says, oh, we found a risk for cardiovascular disease or something that deals with inflammatory bowel disease, you'll have that information so you can look up in your DNA and then and see whether you have any of those risk markers or any new biology that gets discovered. We can go back in and take a look at it later. So great. This company sounds awesome. Um, okay. So to wrap up, I want to get your opinion on like where you think precision medicine is going. Are you of the camp that thinks we're all going to like carry around this little secret bank of our information and bring it to our doctors? Or do you think um, docs and providers will eventually get on board and it'll come from that end? Like where do you kind of see this going for the future? Uh, yeah. Great question. I, there, I think Eric Topol has a great book called The Patient Will See You Now. I don't know if any of your listeners yeah. have heard of it, but it's a really powerful view of, you know, in, in, of engaging and also enabling patients to take control of, of, of their health, their biology, uh, their wellness, even their diseases. And, and I think it's going to be much more of a partnership. I mean, I, I teach first year medical students at Weill Cornell, and I teach them what we call genome guided medicine. So they're, they're the next generation of physicians and doctors and clinicians are all learning about and thinking about how we use all this the latest technology and knowledge of genetics to inform health what is truly precision medicine in that you know you don't give the same drug to the different people and expect uh, the same result we all know that there'll be variability the same thing is true for nutrition same thing is true for general how you generally how you manage your life so i think there's a lot more collaboration between patients and physicians there's a lot more knowledge on the physician side of the power of these methods uh, I mean, the best example is uh, precision medicine in general refers a lot to cancer genetics and precision oncology is that you can tell uh, almost exactly what drug to give based on the mutational profile of each tumor. And, you know, there it's cancers, lung cancers that used to be untreatable uh, are now having people in remission because we know exactly the mutation to target. 
And so it's getting similar to that for different microbial analysis that we can start to pinpoint very specific species and strains that we can tweak and adjust to improve uh, general skin health, gut health, overall health. Uh, and, and really, I think it's going to be much more collaborative, much more people using wearables, people monitoring themselves over time. Because, you know, again, if you, if you have something that changed, the biggest question is going to be, well, well, what were you like before? And if you don't know, then all you know is like you just don't feel well today. So the more we have data that's longitudinal, that's multi-omic, and that's integrated with your health records, the more power we have to address anything that goes wrong and then keep you healthy longer. That's so great. I love that you're teaching medical students. Um, that's one of my passions is going in and uh, for nutrition students talking about this just because yeah. a lot of people don't even know it's out there or there's a lot of misinformation or misuse of it. And so, yeah. you know, teaching them so that they actually get it in school. Cause I, I didn't learn any of this in school. I've had to, it's like self-taught from, yeah. from this yeah. point out, you know, so we got to go back and teach, which I love that. Um, and then I think it's just really empowering. And I think, um, looking at it from a preventative standpoint is super important. Like you said, getting a baseline and knowing, and I think this is kind of like biohacking has been around forever, but like, I think it's yeah. starting to explode a little bit with some really good tech. Yeah. Yeah. Where it's actually, uh, you can, you know, measure the molecules that can make the big difference and then, and you can tweak them in some cases. So, uh, you know, a lot of the science is very new, for example, on the pre and probiotics uh, yeah, is, is really one of the main reasons we started the, the company is to say, well, there's all these products out there. We really need a comprehensive longitudinal platform that measures what they're, what they're doing. And if it's working, great. You know, if it's not, we should try something else. And especially if something doesn't work for anyone to date, we should be clear that, that we know that and maybe not uh, recommend that to many people. I think that's another thing that's your company and people doing this is going to really help is there's the supplement industry is like crazy and yeah. people can go to Whole Foods and all these places and just load up and right. I have things that aren't valid. bags and bags and bags of supplements they're taking yeah. and they don't yeah. really understand or know it's not regulated. So it's like as, as much as we can streamline that supplement regimen and just give them, you know, either target food um, or if we need to go outside food and do more of a supplemental, let's like streamline that. So people aren't overtaking or taking stuff that's interacting. And I think yep. this is kind of one of the first steps to that, especially with probiotics. There's a lot of options out there. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, everything should be data driven. If something works great, we should know why and how. And if it doesn't work, we should be clear that this doesn't work for anyone that we've tested. And we've tested, say, 2000 people and no one's benefited from this. Well, we probably shouldn't sell something that doesn't work or at least table it until, you know, because it could still someday work for five people somewhere. But mm -hmm. if you test the thousands of people and there's no, uh, you know, phenotypic or clinical benefit, uh, we, it probably shouldn't be on the shelves. You know, it's, 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 uh, it's at least a waste of money, but potentially even uh, disrupting someone's uh, ecosystem and their body. Totally. Well, thank you so much. You've given so much information. I love it. We're heightening scientific literacy as well, which I love. Yeah, yeah. Um, great. Feeling. And so you guys have been nice enough to offer us um, a discount on Gut Bio. So I'll be um, mentioning that in the podcast too and in the show notes. So in the show notes, I'll put like, you know, your lab links and um, longevity links and all that. But um, I just want to thank you so much for being here. Oh, great. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. And uh, hopefully I'll see you sometime in New York or at the next conference. Yeah, I would love to. Okay. Thanks, great. Chris. Have a great day. Thanks, Bye.